This is no ordinary balloon. What a view. This is incredible. An Ontario County nonprofit. Hey, what's up guys? Tori here from Overlook Horizon coming to you live here today. It is a Tuesday evening, August 6th, 2019. We are here for the SpaceX launching of Amos 17. It's, a, it's kind of a big deal here for SpaceX and there's a lot of news happening here today. So if you're new to the channel, uh, my name's Tori, this is Overlook Horizon, and uh, we fly high altitude weather balloons to the edge of space and back. And uh, along the way, we kind of talk about space and science and uh, engineering and technology that goes into kind of and related to our high altitude weather balloon mission. So as part of that here, today we're talking about SpaceX and their rocket launch that's coming up. We're also, also gonna talk about Rocket Lab, which just had a big announcement a few minutes ago. But I think what, what I wanna go to uh, first here is uh, we'll probably stick to SpaceX and the rocket launch, let them launch, maybe talk about Rocket Lab after that. I do wanna kind of recap the announcement that they had big announcement from from Rocket Lab. So after launch today, we'll kind of replay and look through that video as well. Um, but uh, right now, at least, uh, we're, we're talking about SpaceX and Amos 17. That's a communication satellite that they are going to be uh, to be launching, and uh, the big deal here is this is a this is kind of a replacement launch, a freebie launch for Spacecom, which is the Amos 17. Uh, uh, provider, or at least the uh, operator for the satellite. Um, this is, uh, if you recall, back in, um, now I'm going to forget the year. Was it like 2000, I want to say 2015? Is that the right year for Amos 6? Um, that was when uh, SpaceX had a uh, anomaly on the pad during static fire, lost the Falcon 9 vehicle, lost the Amos 6 satellite. Uh, everything was completely ruined. They had to rebuild uh, Slick 40. They had to uh, you know, do a lot more work on uh, how they were going to, uh, or the actual second upper stage of the rocket. Um, they um, had to do a lot of work on that to obviously solve it so they don't have anomalies like that. And they also, that's the point where they started doing static fires without the payload on board. So obviously uh, a little safer that way they can do a static fire. They don't have to risk the payload on board. And they've been doing that pretty much ever since. Although recently we saw with their Starlink satellites, they actually did a static fire with, uh, with the payload on board. But that Starlink is a SpaceX satellite. So maybe they were uh, thinking they, they might be able to risk it there. So so anyways, that's what we're talking about here today. We're going to go through and uh, we'll look at what's, uh, what's happening for SpaceX. i got a couple things to show you. We'll switch over to the SpaceX broadcast uh, in a few minutes here once they go live. They probably won't go live for another 15 uh, minutes or so, usually about 15 minutes prior to launch. And over my shoulder here, this is a rough countdown. It should be about that. Uh, it's probably not down to the second, but that gives you kind of a rough idea on where we are for launch. So we still got 29 minutes until SpaceX launches. Also, just a, a heads up, there's a chance of scrub tonight. Um, they, I haven't even, I haven't seen any updates recently. So uh, that's, well, it's kind of good news and bad news. Um, usually at this point, I see at least something that says that fueling has started, but I haven't even seen that. So it's got me a little bit nervous, but, uh, um, but hey, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, let's see. So, um, Oh, so what I was saying, sorry, I was reading a couple of the comments, which I do want to get to in a second, but um, so uh, weather tonight is only 40% go, 60% no go, uh, meaning, uh, you know, it's just kind of the chances of launch. Uh, so the, the rules, launch rules or launch commit criteria that they're looking at today that they may violate would be a lightning rule. So if there's lightning in the vicinity, obviously can't launch. We figured that one out on Apollo 12 when we launched and got... When, uh, NASA launched the Saturn V and got struck by lightning. Um, so we don't launch uh, through lightning anymore. <laughs> um, and also thick cloud rules, um, kind of for the same reason. Uh, but yeah, they don't launch through thick clouds. Um, but yeah, so thick cloud coverage and um, lightning are the two big concerns for launch tonight that, that was going to be an issue with weather. Also, I haven't heard anything about upper level winds. Um, I peeked at them and I didn't see anything too concerning about upper level winds. Uh, earlier today, but, um, but, uh, 
they don't include upper level winds in their pre-launch forecast. So we, that's always something up in the air. Um, anyway, so hello to everybody. I, I see all the comments here. So uh, thanks for joining us here today and hanging out uh, for the launch. So John, uh, John over on YouTube is ready for a rocket launch. Dan's excited. William's hoping they launch tonight. I am also hoping they launch tonight. And Tyler Spaz sent over a hashtag Space Lobster. Today is the one year anniversary of the Space Lobster flight, Overlook Horizon 15, our weather balloon flight that launched the Space Lobster to 100,000 feet. Today's the anniversary. So hashtag Space Lobster to, to all of you. Um, and let's see, hail to the Space Lobster. I love it. Everybody's remembering the Space Lobster today. Um, Space TV says I would send you money uh, I'm assuming with a super chat, but YouTube won't let us. Maybe someone will make a donation for us. Um, well, I think I ha actually, so the way that's set up right now is um, we have we have YouTube for good turned on, um, which comes to us as well. Um, it's just a, it's a notification that if you do a super chat or a donation, um, it's going to a qualified 501c3 charity. Um, so, but I don't know how that works because I think Space TV... I want to say you're not in the U.S., I think, right? Aren't you in the U.K. or something? Um, I feel like I remember seeing that. Um, so I don't know how Super Chat for Good works if you're not in the U.S. Um, but uh, but anyways, yeah, you can always, uh, if you do really want to support, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to beg you, but since you brought it up, uh, if you do want to support us, you can always make a donation at overlookhorizon.com slash donate, or I'm going to try to start being a little more active on Patreon. So we've had a Patreon for a really long time, but I haven't really done a whole lot with it. So I'm actually... Uh, this kind of this summer, I've been trying to revamp our channel a little bit and get a little more into it. Um, so uh, I'm trying to do go the Patreon route a little bit. I'm going to try to do some more stuff on Patreon. If you guys have any suggestions, by all means, you you let me know. Um, but I'm going to try to go the Patreon route. So we do have a Patreon, uh, just Patreon.com/slash Overlook Horizon. Um, try to do some of that that kind of stuff as well. So so that's available as well too. There you go. There's my I'll leave the there's my spiel. Um, anyways, uh, oh yeah, there's Sebi Time Waster, just brought, <laughs> brought it up, said you can support on Patreon. Um, let's see, uh, hi from Sheboygan, Michigan. Hello, Sheboygan, Michigan. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. I just always stuck in my mind because I love the name of that town. <laughs> um, um, rocket launch free zone called the UK. Hope we get a successful launch tonight. Um, Let's see, a couple people over on Facebook. I see Josh hanging out with us. Bill says hello. Um, very dramatic music for the intro. Hello to Columbia. Good evening, Columbia. Thanks for joining us here. What's the countdown for? This is to the SpaceX launch, Amos 17 coming down, or going up, not coming down. Hopefully it doesn't come down, it's gonna go up. Um, in 24 minutes, we should be launching. launching. And we'll go through, uh, I do have a couple things to show for that. Um, can you make me a moderator on YouTube since no other moderators online at the moment? Oh yeah, we don't have any moderators here. Um, I don't know. Can I do this? Um, can I, let's see. Add moderator. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Sebi Time Waster, uh, one of our regulars. It's also joining us on the Discord channel. Just made you a moderator so that you can so you can moderate today. Um, thanks for thanks for the offer. <laughs> um, Let's see, uh, there were a couple other comments that I missed. 723 still on, yes, we're still on for 723 p.m. Eastern time. That's in about 24 minutes for the SpaceX launch. Um, Surefire on Periscope wants to know if we have a GoFundMe. I don't have anything for GoFundMe, but uh, but we do have the, the Patreon thing. I feel like that's a little, uh, I don't really have anything to uh, specifically like physical to offer for a GoFundMe. Like it's not like we're offering a product. Um, but the Patreon kind of thing, we're going to try to do some more exclusive stuff, maybe some behind the scenes. I've been doing, actually, while we were testing all our live video stuff, I have been doing um, some live streams over on the Patreon uh, that were Patreon exclusive uh, that were... Um, that we're kind of a behind the scenes development testing of the live video system for our weather balloon flight. So I'm gonna to try to do a little more of those behind the scenes things uh, over on Patreon. We've also got, uh, we're gonna be developing a new circuit board for next year's flights. And so uh, uh, depending on the Patreon level that you're at, um, we'll also be doing, looking at, we'll be sharing some schematics and things like that uh, over on Patreon. And uh, we've got some exclusive Discord channels as well for that. Um, Okay, so let's jump into what's happening here today now that we've uh, said hello to 
as many people as I, as I could. Oh, and Dylan Boy wants a shout out. All right. I don't usually just like to shout out just for the shout outs. You got to at least say something interesting. But just because you, you were the only one that asked, I'll, I'll, we'll shout out Dylan Boy. Okay. <laughs> all right. Anyways. All right. Let's go over to uh, what's happening here uh, today. So, uh, so this is Amos. 17. It's operated by Spacecom. It's a telecommunications satellite. Uh, I believe it's serving. It's going to be serving like the Africa Middle East area. So it's not for us here in the U.S. Um, but um, but uh, the big news, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, is this is a replacement flight or a freebie flight for Spacecom because of the Amos 6 anomaly that lost their vehicle. Um, so. Uh, this is the this is actually a really cool mission patch. I, don't, I feel like the SpaceX mission patches are getting cooler and cooler every you know every mission. I really like this one. It's kind of it's kind of awkward, funky colors here with this like green and the I don't know whatever this like sea foam green thing is here on the outer rim. But I, I don't know. I really like this. I like this this mission patch here. This is pretty cool. Um, so uh, that's today's mission patch here, but uh, let's take a look at uh, some statistics here for today. I do like to show the statistics because it's always interesting to see what's happening with SpaceX. Some people just see a snapshot and they don't think, uh, they don't get the big picture on what's happening with all of these launches. So this is the 82nd SpaceX launch, 74th Falcon 9 launch, 54th Falcon 9 full thrust, 17th full thrust block five. So I can't believe we're at that many block fives already. It was just a year, a little over a year ago, last May, when they did the first block five. It seemed like that was a big deal. That was brand new. Now we're up to 17 of them. Um, this is going to be the third flight for this block five. So it's already flown twice, fly a third time now. Um, but this will definitely be the last flight for this booster because this is an expendable mission. Only the second time they've expended a block five. Um, but the mission parameters here, it's a little bit interesting mission parameters for this particular one because they've launched heavier payloads and been, been able to recover a, a block five booster. So the question comes up, it's like, well, wait, what, what's the, usually if the payload is really, really heavy, then you got to use a lot of fuel and get a lot of Delta V to get it into orbit. So it makes sense. The payload is really heavy. It's maybe you just don't have enough fuel left. And so when you get a little bit of a lighter payload like this, you go, well, wait a minute, why is, why can't we recover this one? Why is this one being expended? Well, this is a, a lot of time. There's, there's so many things that go into the orbital mechanics for when they launch these, these satellites. And so uh, it's really going to come, come down to, I don't know this hundred percent sure, but uh, with relative certainty, it's going to come down to the orbital mechanics and what the final orbit is going to be where the Falcon nine drops off the satellite. So um, this is going to be, a geostationary satellite. So it's going to sit in one spot uh, over um, over Earth and follow the rotation of the Earth. So when you get into geostationary orbits, most of the time you go into what's called a geostationary transfer orbit, and that's the green ring that you see here. Um, and that's where the Falcon 9 will drop itself, drop it off, and the spacecraft will uh, get itself into the geostationary orbit. Now, this is a really uh, narrow elliptical orbit, but it doesn't have to be that narrow. Um, so you could, you know, if in order to reduce the amount of fuel that the spacecraft needs, uh, they could, the Falcon 9 could get it into a closer orbit that's a little more circular. It could uh, maybe put it in a super synchronous orbit and put the apogee farther than geostationary, which could reduce a little bit of the fuel needed for it to circularize itself. So there's a whole bunch of things that go into it as far as where the Falcon 9 is going to drop it off. And it seems like for this launch, they're going to be expending a little extra energy to get the spacecraft into a more ideal orbit. So then the spacecraft itself will have uh, will need less fuel to circularize, and then it'll have more fuel reserves to do in-orbit maneuvers and corrections and things like that. So it's probably pretty nice of them to do that sort of thing, especially since the Amo 6 one didn't work out so well. So, um, yeah, stream start. Yeah, so SpaceX has got the uh, intro card up there. It's really, really loud in my ear. Uh, we're going to mute that here because I can't talk with it playing in my ear. You can probably even hear it bleeding over to the microphone. Um, Let's see, um, um, missed a couple, well, let me, I'll get back to some comments here. Um, one more, uh, 
thing I wanted to get to at least before we get to the SpaceX stream is just show you an idea of what the timeline is going to be here for today. Um, so this is the timeline for today. Um, so we're into the count. Obviously, things are progressing. They wouldn't even start this live card if they weren't uh, progressing. Um, so that means that we're into fuel loading which is usually a good sign that they're really gonna give it a good effort um, and that they think there might be a chance that the weather clears up enough to launch today. So uh, we're gonna see if that happens, um, but we're gonna count it down to zero. Uh, after that, we'll have max Q, first stage, second stage, separation, fairing deployment. Oh, big news, forgot to mention, fairing deployments. They do have Go Miss Tree out in the water to go do a fairing recovery here today. So hopefully they have Go Miss Tree and I think Go Navigator. Um, I think that's the one, I don't know if it's Go Navigator or Go Searcher, but I think it's Go Navigator that's out there as well. So um, they will they will catch one fairing in the big net uh, and then they will, the other fairing, they will softly splash down into the ocean and uh, and then they will go, uh, go pick it up later. Um, you know, just a few minutes later, but uh, they, they will st still come down under parachute like this. Uh, one will catch it in the net and one will, uh, one will softly, softly, hopefully touch down in the water and then, uh, then they can go pick it up. I was looking for, where's my Mr. Steven picture in case you don't know what they're going to, there it is. Now this is kind of, I should, I should update this this picture a little bit because this is an older one with the smaller net now they have a much larger net on board but this is the idea this is the oh, i keep calling it mr steven i gotta forget there's a name change it's not mr steven anymore it's go miss tree um so uh so yeah the big boat with a big net on the back that they're going to catch the fairing and hopefully they've only done it once before Let's see if they can generate some consistency with this are they going to be able to do it more than once can we do it a second time in a row here That'll be the interesting thing to watch here tonight. That's probably one of the most exciting things uh, that I'm interested in seeing tonight is the uh, the fairing landing, just to see if they can get some consistency with this. Like, was last time a fluke? Was it lucky? Did they just happen to get there? Or, or had they figured this out? Are they going to be able to do this on a more regular basis? Um, so there's that. And um, also, side note, in case you're following the uh, SpaceX naval fleet here, uh, just read the instructions. The autonomous drone ship that catches the rockets out on the west coast apparently is moving to the east coast. Or I guess in the screen it's this way. Um, but they're moving to the east coast. Uh, right now it's traveling down through the Panama Canal. Not really sure why. Um, always assumed that was going to stay on the west coast. And they were going to have, uh, of course, I still love you on the east coast. And they were supposed to build a third one on the east coast called a shortfall of gravitas. Um, but I uh, haven't heard any new developments of that, so maybe they're scrapping that and bringing Just Read the Instructions over. Also, I don't think there's any West Coast launches planned for a really long time for SpaceX, so maybe they're just like, ah, well, we don't need it out here. Let's move it over to the East Coast. So, um, so yeah, not sure what's going on with that. Uh, I hope they catch it again. Hopefully this storm north of the launch will dissipate. Yeah, that's a good, good question. I ought to get... Um, we ought to check out... Um, uh, what the weather is like down at the Cape. Oh yeah, this is, this is not pretty here. Let's, let's show everybody what we're dealing with here. Um, so this is the weather at the Cape. Um, it's not, not looking great at the moment. Um, but you can see there's a little, itty bitty tiny opening here, right? Here's the launch pad. Uh, or I think, uh, I guess, let's see, it would be actually the launch pad would be like here here i'm pretty sure it's like in this region um so you could maybe get an opening here i hope we'll see if, see if we can squeeze something in if those clouds just kind of sneak off to the side they might be able to launch and, and go up and over it here so all right it looks like uh spacex is about to go live here so we'll let them chat it up we'll kind of comment about it but stick around after launch we're going to do a couple of giveaways and then uh, we're going to talk about Rocket Lab, the big Rocket Lab announcement that just happened a little while ago. We're going to chat about that. I'm going to get to your comments as well because um, I know I have missed a whole bunch of those. I'm probably going to read those while SpaceX is is chatting it up over here. But let's listen to what they have to say. 
And uh, I guess I better turn the volume back up too, right? The sixth, and you're looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket as it awaits at 7.23 p.m. Eastern Time launch from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Florida. My name is Kate Tice, and I'm a SpaceX certification engineer here at company headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Welcome to the webcast for the AMOS 17 mission, SpaceX's 10th launch of 2019. We'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to Spacecom CEO David Pollack and the nearly 200 Spacecom guests who have traveled from across the globe to watch today's launch from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. On today's mission, we will be flying Spacecom's AMOS 17, a geostationary communication satellite which will provide internet, phone, and secure communications to customers in the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. We're currently at T minus 12 and a half minutes until liftoff, and currently all systems are go. Let's take a look at that rocket there on the pad. That's good news. All system, well, they said all systems are go. So that's our 70 meter two stage liquid fueled rocket. The bottom two thirds that you see there is the first stage, which accelerates the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere to the edge of space with the help of nine Merlin engines. This will be the third and final flight for this booster, which previously flew on the SHL-2 mission last November and on Telstar 19V just over a year ago. We will not be recovering the first stage following today's mission. There on the screen, you can see quite a bit of white gas floating around, totally normal. That's just the liquid oxygen from inside the vehicle venting and, and, and turning into gas as it makes contact with the atmosphere. On top of the first stage is the black carbon fiber interstage, and on top of that is the F9 second stage. And that's what takes the payload to its eventual destination in orbit. The stages separate at about two and a half minutes into flight. The second stage has a single Merlin vacuum, or as you hear us refer to it, MVAC engine, and that ignites after the first stage separates. The second stage is what we will be carrying the AMOS-17 satellite to geostationary transfer orbit. The satellite is safely enclosed inside of the 17-foot diameter payload fairing, which you see right there, the pointy cone at the top of the rocket. This protects the payload from aerothermal loads, heating, and contamination during ascent. Once we reach the vacuum of space, we'll jettison the fairing as the second stage continues on its journey to orbit. We will be attempting to recover the fairing halves tonight with our recovery vessel, Ms. Tree, formerly known as Mr. Stephen. Our hope is to catch one of the fairing halves in the ship's nets and then recover the other half from the water with our other recovery vessel, Go Navigator. Our catch attempt will occur around T plus 45 minutes into flight, which will be after our webcast concludes, so we'll be providing any additional oh, updates no. um, on those catches via our social media accounts. Yeah, all right. Well, I guess we Lastly, won't see that live. Lastly, the large trust structure that you see there is the transporter erector, or TE. That's what we use to hold the rock to roll the rocket out to the pad from the hangar and then raise it to its vertical launch position as as you see there. The TE also routes the vehicle's fluids, power, and telemetry umbilicals from the ground systems to the to the rocket and satellites until F9 goes on internal power and clears the pad. At liftoff, that's what we'll retract in order to clear the way for F9's ascent. Good afternoon. I'm John Isberger, the Falcon, Hello, Falcon John. Principal <laughs> Integration Engineer at SpaceX and we're just inside 10 minutes before launch. Good news is we're working no issues on Falcon 9, but weather? we are closely watching the weather. Yeah, yeah. Falcon 9 rolled out to the pad with the Amos 17 satellite at T-minus 16 hours and went vertical about 12 hours ago. Now the chief engineer held a technical poll at T-minus one hour, and then the launch director held both the propellant load and launch go, no-go poles at T-minus 38 minutes. Now the go, no-go poll covers the 10 people who are counting down the Falcon. They electronically click on go in their online procedure. Now for Falcon 9, we've been loading propellant since T minus 35 minutes. Falcon 9 uses rocket grade kerosene, which we call RP1 for its fuel and liquid oxygen or LOX as the oxidizer. It's that cold LOX that's causing the condensation clouds that you see around the first and second stages. Now with fuel and oxidizer on hand, we do need an ignition source to complete the fire triangle. Now for Falcon 9, this is T-Tub liquid, which is our igniter. You might see this at T-minus zero as a green glow right before the engine's light and the rocket takes off. You now like currently fuel is completely loaded on the second glow. stage. <laughs> fuel is scheduled to finish up on the first stage at about T-minus six minutes before launch. 
And meanwhile, liquid oxygen load is continuing on both first and second stages. Now, in addition to the RP-1 fuel and the liquid oxygen, Falcon 9 also uses helium to keep the tanks pressurized in flight. This helps fill the empty volume created as we deplete propellant out of the stages. Helium load began before the webcast went live. We're topping off until about the last minute and a half before launch. Now, engine chill will begin at T-minus seven minutes. You're getting the team ready in a minute to open up the pre-valves between the first stage propellant tanks and the nine Merlin engines. This will allow a little bit of cold liquid oxygen to flow into the turbo pumps, bringing them down to a temperature close to that of the super chilled propellant that will soon be flowing through the engines at liftoff. So the Falcon 9's looking good. On the satellite side, the Spacecom team transferred AMOS 17 to internal power starting at T-minus 30 minutes. They completed that at T-minus 15 minutes. They're ready for launch. They're just monitoring telemetry on the spacecraft. The range tells us that they are green, air, and sea space are cleared. And the big one is the weather. weather. We had to delay half an hour this evening for launch. Currently, the weather rules are all green, but we're watching everything okay. as we go through the last seven minutes of the countdown. So right now, all systems continue to be go for liftoff at 23 minutes after the hour. As we mentioned earlier, tonight's mission is for Spacecom, a satellite operator headquartered in Israel. Today we're launching AMOS-17. AMOS stands for African Mediterranean Orbital Satellite, and the 17 is for 17 degrees east longitude location of the satellite. Built by Boeing, it'll be the most advanced high-throughput satellite providing communication services to Africa and have a life expectancy of over 20 years. Let's get some more details on our customer payload tonight. All right, they might have some music here, which I'll, yeah. so I'll have to turn this. I'll have to turn this down because the music here, otherwise YouTube will freak out and give me a copyright strike, which we don't want any of that. Um, and if you're not watching on YouTube, if you're on Periscope or Facebook or Twitch, and you're watching uh, the simulcast, just know that we are also streaming on YouTube, and so and YouTube has really, really strict rules on the music stuff. So gotta cut down that music here. So, um, but fortunately, there's no talking. I mean, I can hear it in my my earpiece there, which is probably bleeding over to the microphone. Hopefully not. Not too, too much. Um, but uh, yeah, I ought to take that out of my ear here. Um, but so tonight's launch window is 87 minutes long. Now the, the question is gonna be, so they delayed by 30 minutes, um, but I don't think they have enough time to recycle. Uh, they generally, once they start loading fuel into the rocket, they generally can't recycle uh, to give it a second temp. So once they once they go and they start pushing forward like this and they put start putting fuel and liquid oxygen into the rocket, uh, then really this is going to be the only attempt here for today. Um, if they if they have to push off uh, or delay, there, there's probably not enough time left in the window to completely recycle all the fueling. Um, but, uh, but yeah, anyway, so uh, it sounds like we're looking good for launch today, um, at least um, from a weather standpoint. I mean, that was kind of the big issue when they were looking at whether they're going to launch today is, is the weather. And there were a lot of storms, as we just looked at it a minute ago, um, that were potentially going to be hazardous. So... We'll see, see if that holds out. From liftoff, Falcon 9 is now moving into the final stages of the countdown. First and second stages are both nearly fully loaded with over 1 million pounds of kerosene fuel and liquid oxygen. Stage one actually finished loading just a moment ago and we have also begun chilling of the nine Merlin engines. We're also getting ready now for the completion of liquid oxygen loading on both stage one. That'll happen at about T minus three minutes Second stage will close out at about T minus two minutes. The view on the screen is Falcon 9, the strong back part of the transporter erector still around the vehicle. We're getting ready to open up the clamp arms that attach to the second stage. Once the arms are open, coming open right now, you can see them. We will then begin retracting the strong back. That'll be coming up in about 10 seconds. The strong back will recline about two degrees away from the Falcon 9. Now just keep in mind, I forgot to turn my microphone back on. Just keep in mind that, so there's Beginning a lot of weather around. of the strong back. Now we're using hydraulic struts to pull it back and at liftoff, those hydraulic struts will pull it farther away as the rocket lifts off to clear the strong back. Another event coming up at T minus 60 seconds is the call out that Falcon 9 is in startup. 
This means that the rocket's autonomous internal flight computers have taken over the launch countdown. There are three flight computers on the second stage to constantly compare commands and calculations with each other. That way, if any one computer develops a fault, the other two can safely continue the flight. So Falcon 9's looking good, the Amos 17 payload, the Spacecom team, everything continues to be good for them. Currently the range is tracking no issues, everything is clear for launch, and the weather continues to cooperate, but we've still got a few minutes to go. So as we've passed just inside T-minus three minutes, let's listen in to the countdown nets for the terminal count of Falcon 9 with Amos 17. Okay, so what I was going to say is to keep in mind, so from a weather standpoint, a couple of people have mentioned in the comments... LDCE, this is RC on wow. Countdown 1, be advised the range has gone no go at this time. Continue with the count, we'll execute a range hold at T-minus 30 seconds if the range does not clear the issue. Oh no, the range is not clear. Sounds like they have a range violation. Uh, no, I... it got stuck range violation, that would be like a boat or an airplane or a human in the restricted zone, but it sounds like they have a, ra a range violation. Um, so I don't. I just heard that on the countdown net, so uh, we're going to have to check and see what that, that is. Just, lost. Close up. It said range is no go. It didn't say, necessarily say weather, um, but uh, we're going to have to see what, what that was all about. But what, I'm, what I wanted to say before they hold here is... Um, when they do launch, even if there's weather in the area, they just need a small window to go through because for the most part, that weather is super low level and they can fly and get above the weather and fl even fly over most of the weather, depending on how high those cloud tops are. If you get some of those huge thunderhead clouds, they can get, they can get really high in the atmosphere. But for the most part, yeah, they can fly up and over the weather pretty quickly. So they just need a small opening to get up and over the clouds and precipitation and lightning and all that kind of stuff. Um, LDCE, this is RCN Countdown. Be advisor, continue with the count. The ranges go at this time. Oh, ranges go. So, sounds like there was a violation, um, but they cleared it really, really quickly. Wow. That had me nervous for a minute. F9 is on startup. That's kind of crazy. That was quick. Stage two, pressing for flight. I just didn't know what happened there. I'm going to try to quiet down here for a minute. LD is go for launch. Usually they would hold it 30 seconds if there's a weather or a range issue. It sounds like they're going to push through. T minus 30 seconds. There they go. Past the 30 second point. Sounds like we're in. Pretty much just automatic cutoffs at this point. There's usually no human cutoffs. Stage one, pressing for flight. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition, lift off. Vehicle is pitching downrange. Red power and slum train nominal. Vehicle is supersonic. Coming up on one minute into flight, we're getting ready for maximum dynamic pressure. Vehicle has reached maximum aerodynamic pressure. So there's Max Q that's pushing through now, going through a little bit of cloud coverage, getting hard to see it. You've heard the call out. We're through the region of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Vehicle going supersonic as we leave the denser parts of the lower Earth's atmosphere. Falcon 9 trajectory looks good. 
All nine Merlin engines are at power. Everything looking good for Falcon 9. We're heading due east from Cape Canaveral, headed to the first of two orbits planned for today. Nice view from the onboard camera looking back at the plume slowly expanding as we leave the atmosphere. The plume will get larger as we get out to the vacuum of space. Now today, first aid shutdown is planned for about T plus two minutes, 45 seconds. We won't be recovering the first stage today, so that leaves more propellant to burn to achieve the required orbit for the satellite. If you compare that to last week's CRS-18 resupply flight to the space station, on that mission, the first stage shut down almost half a minute sooner than today. We needed to reserve enough propellant to be able to turn the first stage and return it all the way back to the launch site. Now coming up quickly in 20 seconds, a sequence of events, main engine cut off, the nine main engine shut down, stage separation, and then ignition of the second stage engine coming up in just under 15 seconds. Yeah, so right around 2.45 in the countdown, or the count up now, uh, that's when that event is gonna happen here. Uh, normally it would have happened uh, for a landing, usually right around like 2.15 or so is when, they would happen, when it would happen if they were gonna do a landing. Uh, but yeah, no yep. landing today. And actually this- AVI stage uh, separation uh, confirmed. Watch the stiffener ring fall off the engine bell here, right? There. There it goes. <laughs> Completely normal. Happens every single time. It's a little stiffener ring. We've had successful ignition of the second stage engine. The Merlin Vacuum D engine is up at power. Turbine speed Page looks one, good. You can see the nozzle beginning to glow red. A tradition stage for two, the upper nominal stage. Trajectory. First stage has completed its mission. It's falling back to Earth. As we said, we won't recover it. Coming up next, fairing separation out in the vacuum of space. Yeah, so a couple of people wondered, like, are they going to soft land the booster? Are they going to do any sort? And I don't think they're doing any of that. There's no... Uh, yeah, fairing separation confirmed. Here's our fairing separation. That they will recover. Nice view in the late afternoon. Sun shining on the payload fairing. The you second the stage has separated the payload fairing around the Amos 17 spacecraft is we're now in the vacuum of space. Right now, Merlin vacuum engine continues to be on power. Trajectory looks good. Stage two is right in the middle of the predicted path. Avionics reports their systems are nominal. So coming up four minutes and 15 seconds, Mark, we are go on Falcon 9 carrying Amos 17 to the parking orbit, the first of two orbits for today. Yeah, so um, I lost my train of thought what I was going to say uh, a bit early. Oh, the uh, the booster coming back down. Um, so a couple of people wondered, are they going to soft land the booster or anything like that? This booster has no grid fins on it, no landing legs. Um, so they really have no control authority for coming down to do a soft landing. They'd have to have at least grid fins on it to have that sort of control authority, um, usually. Um, I mean, they, they do have, obviously, thrust vector control with the engines themselves. Um, but not a lot of engine capability because they've used all their uh, all their fuel up to get it so into So just this past the orbit. T plus five minute mark into today's mission for Amos 17. In case if you've just joined us, we had a slight delay due to weather over at uh, Florida launch site, but we did take off at 23 minutes after the hour. And as you can see on your screen, the stages have separated. And there we have a beautiful shot of planet Earth as the second stage nozzle is glowing gorgeous red, orange, um, as it's carrying AMO-17 to geostationary transfer Earth. orbit. Stage two on nominal trajectory. We have confirmation that the trajectory for stage two is nominal. So, uh Mark over on our YouTube channel says uh, the Falcon 9 is so reliable, he says, uh, or so proven at this point, I think they could probably just launch it directly into a storm. So the interesting thing Just after thing the here second stage ignited, you may have noticed a couple of pieces coming off from the nozzle. Um, if you've tuned into our launches before, you see that every time. Those are basically, bas that's basically just a stiffening ring that we place at the end of the nozzle to give it a little bit of structural integrity for transportation purposes while the rocket is still on the ground. Not really necessary uh, once the rocket has taken off and they fall away. So talking about the Falcon 9 going through a storm. So the, the, inter the interesting thing is I definitely don't think they could fly through a storm. 
But the next what SpaceX major is event really that we good are approaching at about the eight minute and nine minute. second mark will be the first of two second engine cutoffs, or SECO-1. So, all right, let me see if I can try to get this out. What SpaceX has gotten very good at, every space vehicle has load limits on them, uh, particularly in that Max-Q area. Um, and SpaceX has gotten particularly good at knowing what those limits are and not launching through those limits. Um, and so there's a lot of math involved with it, uh, a lot of weather observation and things like that. Uh, at this point in the mission, and the second stage is pulling about three and a half Gs. You yourself may have experienced that. If you've ever been on a big roller coaster, equivalent to that, the space shuttle encountered about three and a half Gs whenever it was taking off and re-entering. All right, I'm trying not to talk over them, but yeah, so uh, flying through a storm like that would violate those load limits, um, and it's really not so Terminal much effects. the, uh, you know, it's really the horizontal forces on this vertical, relatively vertical rocket. So we're less than 30 um, seconds limits. away from second engine cutoff right, I'm one. I'm turn them down so I can finish my thoughts. Uh, they have limits on the vehicle so that they like know before, what the maximum loads are that they can fly through and where those, those wind shears are and at what point the wind shear would actually start to cause a problem. Because with wind shear, the thing with wind shear is it causes any sort of vertical rocket, especially when you get a big vertical rocket like the Falcon 9, um, which is not even really that huge, but it's a lot bigger than like the Electron rocket, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, when you get those wind shears, you get kind of this rebound effect where the, I don't know if I can do this with my hand, but it starts to kind of wobble as it's going up because you get, when you get wind shear, the high winds push the top of the rocket, the rocket thrusts to correct, and it starts to kind of kind of do like one of these things on the way up. Um, and that gets really bad because you get vibrations and torques on the rocket that, uh, that it's not designed for. Um, so that's kind of the whole deal with the upper level winds and the wind shear is you don't want to get that torquing and that sort of vibration that, oh, and then they just went away. Um, so now they're into, um, into their parking orbit. And I'm going to mute this in my ear so that uh, I can actually talk and hear. Um, but so, yeah, they, with those upper level winds, you don't want to get into that scenario where it starts creating vibrations or um, kind of that, uh, that rebound type effect. So anyways, um, what a great shot with the sun. Uh, says quad quadratic adder. Yeah, absolutely. It looks fantastic there. I love I love when the sun is kind of low in the sky like that. It does look pretty cool. Um, all right, I missed a whole bunch of comments there, but uh, you'll have to, if, you, if I missed them, you can feel free to throw them in here again. Um, the wind is a problem, the lightning not so much. I mean, lightning could still be a problem. Um, you know, theoretically, it's supposed to be able to to survive lightning, kind of like an airplane could survive a lightning strike, but you don't really want to test that. It didn't work out so well for Apollo 12. Um, you know, a bunch of their systems went kind of haywire on Apollo 12, and there's a lot of sensitive equipment on there. Also, keep in mind the computer systems on the Falcon 9 are not, uh, they're not radiation hardened or anything special. They're really just kind of off the shelf computer equipment that they're using to to fly the Falcon 9. And what they do to compensate that is they have three different computer systems. And so if any one of them has sort of an anomaly, the other two take over and they instruct the, the anomalous one to reset itself and reboot. Um, and that's how they get past not having to get like radiation hardened computers and things like that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, lightning with sensitive electronics and things like that, still not really something you wanna, you wanna test out if you don't have to. Um, Let's see. Um, what else did we miss here for comments? Um, Seco complete. Yep. So the, the boy, I missed it while I was talking, but yeah, they're in their parking orbit now. Um, Columbia says SpaceX is really nailing down these launches. Great job. Yeah, so they're getting they're they're getting very reliable. Um, one of the things we I skipped over it here in the um, in the stats that we were looking at earlier. Um, but I did want to mention it here if I can pull it back up when we were, we were talking about go miss tree Which apparently we're not gonna see uh, Not gonna see live here today because that's gonna happen at T plus 45 minutes and they're only the satellite deployments at about 30 minutes um, So they will they'll they'll 
be done with the broadcast after about 30, like 31 minutes, I think is when deployment is. So they won't stick around for the uh, fairing recovery. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out here, um, let me see if I can pull this up here real quick. What was the, uh, um, it was oh, the very last one at the bottom. There it is. This is the 46th launch since amo 6 so amo 6 was where they had that anomaly with static fire on the pad this they've launched 46 times now since that which it doesn't seem like they could possibly fit that many in um, but they're they are getting pretty good at it they did have to do two static fires for this vehicle so they did a static fire they had some sort of valve that had a problem they swapped it out replaced it and did another static fire obviously they were happy with that one and decided to push on with the mission um, but that kind of proves the concept of why they do those static fires they 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 did a static fire and obviously when they lead up to static fire they kind of go through their regular checks and things um, like they would for a launch and so they obviously got to the point where they said okay this is safe enough to do a static fire they did the static fire but they still discovered an anomaly that was not going to be good for the vehicle so so after the static fire, they fixed that valve then did the static fire again and then continued on. And, and it, you know, without the static fire, they would have they would have launched with that bad valve. And who know who knows what would have happened at that point. So um, let's see. Um, I thought they had more than two. Uh, might be wrong, two completely independent sets maybe. I think, yeah, so I think on the computer system, I believe, I know they have three computers in a cluster um, and that's how they keep track of it. I think they might have two sets of three computers um, that control the vehicle. Uh, I might be wrong on that, but uh, I, I know it's at least, I know they at least have three because um, that's how they handle the redundancy, but I think it's two sets of three that um, that handle the flight vehicle. Um, any launches coming up at Wallops? Um, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm sure there are. Um, I don't know what the next one is off the top of my head. Uh, I'm sure we could probably look it up uh, at some point. Um, Chusakan is throwing out some dollar signs. I'm assuming it's $3,977 per pound. Is that uh, the launch cost for Falcon 9? I don't know that off the top of my head, but, um, but that would be... Somebody was asking me that earlier. Um, let's see, what do you, news spot or live, what do you think it will be like 10 years from now? I can't even begin to imagine. So, I mean, we got all kinds of things to talk about, but this reusability and bringing the cost of getting to space down is, is just going to increase, uh, you know, the number of providers that get into space flight, which means the cost will come down even further because there'll be more competition and then you'll get, you know, the small set, so SpaceX also announced earlier this week, uh, or might have, it was yesterday actually, right? Um, that they were gonna start getting to, into the small satellite market, which is kind of exciting, because um, that's kind of been Rocket Lab's gig for a long time, is the small satellite market. You know, those really tiny like CubeSats and MicroSats and things like that, that, um, that can't afford to pay an entire cost for a Falcon 9. So they do these kind of regular small sat launches and, uh, these little tiny satellites can pay, you know, not that much money to actually get into space. And so SpaceX has now said that they're going to start dedicating space on Falcon 9s and do them uh, have a couple of regularly scheduled Falcon 9 launches that they can ride share those small sats. Um, and so that's, you know, that's going to start to open up this whole other market where you get all these small satellite providers that, um, you know, you're almost getting down to like the DIY market. I don't think we're quite there yet, but at some point, you know, presumably you'll, you'll be able, and you can do this now, it just costs a little bit of money, but you could build a satellite mechanism. And as long as it meets their specs, you send it off and away it goes. Well, wow, I'm getting notifications that my stream is having issues with bandwidth. Um, so hopefully I didn't stutter there too much. Uh, I don't know what that's, uh, I don't know what that's all about. Uh, we should should have plenty of bandwidth. We're uh, hardwired today. Um, anyways. Okay, so let's see. Uh, what else are we going to get to? Um, so I do want to talk about uh, Rocket Lab at uh, some point here. Um, and 
Uh, let me get to your comments here because I do have to, uh, I'm going to have to read back and see some of these. Um, um, oh yeah, so there you go. D suit says 10 years from now, the question to me is will Starship and Super Heavy fly by then, like really finally, regularly? I think, I think there's a good shot of that 10 years from now that they'll be flying that regularly. I mean, the, the pace that SpaceX is moving, even just for development of Starship, is pretty impressive. But you do have to see. Um, you know, there's going to be road, road bumps uh, along the way that they're going to have to resolve things and things that they're going to fix. There's a big announcement on August 24th from SpaceX and Elon um, that will be some updates on Starship and Super Heavy. Um, so presumably there'll be some design changes uh, that they've discovered during the build process. And now they're going to make some changes and basically they're going to be announcing those, what those changes are going to be. There's a, they're coming up on the 200 meter hop which is like 600 feet or so. Um, that's coming up here. Uh, I think it's scheduled for like Monday, right? It's the 200 meter hop. So they're they're really starting to, and this is just the star hopper. Uh, they haven't really done anything with the orbital class version yet, but they, they have said that they're gonna start moving on the orbital class um, flights and do, I think they're gonna do suborbital flights to start with, but with the orbital class uh, version. And that's gonna be in a, um, I don't know, a couple months down the road. They're getting, I mean, they're making a lot of progress on building that, so we'll, we'll see. Um, they have to learn how to put out brush fires. Yeah, they did start a, a quite a large brush fire after the last hop attempt. Uh, that was kind of a, whoops. <laughs> um, they do, like, uh, Kennedy Space Center has crews that specifically clear out the brush in the area and anything that, that could potentially be uh, combustible they they take uh, they do have maintenance and grounds crews that basically clear all that brush out, um, and I'm assuming the SpaceX has done that, but obviously they need to do a little bit more than that. They had a big brush fire after the last hop, so oops. Um, they SpaceX has not had a good time with fire lately, which is not a good thing for a rocket company. They did have they had a fire at their Cape Canaveral site where they're building. The star, the uh, starship at Cape Canaveral. Uh, apparently, they had two fires there. One nobody even knew about, and the other one uh, was kind of public and posted about quite a bit. Um, but uh, and then obviously they had the brush fire. It's like you know, well, one right after another. <laughs> um, starship works as intended. It'll fly very regularly if they have plans for thirty-minute international flights using it. Yeah, that's kind of the Earth-to-Earth -Earth flights with Starship. They want to go from like New York to Australia. Um, with the Starship and they want to turn that into basically the next commercial airplanes instead of taking an airplane to get to Australia you could hop on a rocket a Starship in New York and be in Australia 30 minutes later instead of like an entire day later um, how many satellites does Elon have orbiting now well so Elon the only ones that are actual Sorry, I got screaming in the background here. We're home. <laughs> um, the only ones that are actual SpaceX satellites um, that are that would technically be Elon's are the Starlink ones. So there's only 60 of those that are in orbit right now. We've only done one Starlink launch, um, and there's only 60 of those. So they will have thousands of them at some point, but we're only at 60. Uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a long time, years before we get to those you know thousands of satellites numbers. It's probably going to be years before we even get to hundreds of satellites. Um, but uh, yeah, they only have sixty right now. But they've launched way more than that. But those are not Elon's satellites. They're it's Elon's rocket or SpaceX's rocket that is launching uh, a satellite for whoever their um, whoever their customer is. Um, Let's see what else we got. Tori, was it an alien son? <laughs> Not unless you think my kids are aliens. <laughs> no, just kids trying to go to bed. Um, trying to go to bed. Dad's trying to do a live stream. <laughs> um, that one weird. Somebody's that was weird. Somebody's excited. Yeah, they're they're excited for the SpaceX launch. They wanted to stay up, learn. They want to stay up and learn if the fairing half is caught. And they have not heard about the Rocket Lab announcement yet, so I haven't told them. <laughs> Um, let's see. I'd go on a SpaceX rocket, says Catherine. Um, will you be streaming the the uh, AEHF 
five launch on Thursday. I don't. I'm not planning to stream the the ULA launch on Thursday, only because I have so much to do with our weather balloon video video footage. I got I have a million things set that I'm trying to put. I'm trying to put together our videos, and so I, I'm not planning on doing it right now. Um, I don't know. That could change at some point, but right now I'm not planning to do the ULA stream. Um, just so that I can get our videos out so we can spend some time on that. Um, let's see. Uh, surprised they did lift off with that much cloud coverage. Yeah, it's usually, I mean, having some cloud coverage is okay. It's really like thick cloud coverage that is a, that is a big deal. Um, especially if you get like big thunderhead clouds or anything like that. That's a, that's, that's no good. Um, Let's see. Uh, so yeah, there we're uh, we're waiting for T plus thirty one minutes, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll have deployment there. Let's see. Um, when is the next SpaceX lift up? That's a good question. When is the next SpaceX flight? I'm gonna have to look it up. Um. It is, who knows, the, somebody can probably find the answer faster than I can. I don't know, uh, I've been so, we've had all of our flights going on, so my head has been spinning lately. Um, so we've got uh, the ULA launch is happening Thursday. We've got Rocket Lab is doing another launch. The, that's Look Ma No Hands, that's coming up in nine days. Um, Let's see, the next one after that for SpaceX. That's a good question. What is the next one for SpaceX? I don't know. We gotta do Dragon in-flight abort at some point. That's uh, that's still kind of to be determined at this point. I don't know, what, what is the next SpaceX launch? I don't know, I was looking at my schedule here. I don't know what the next SpaceX launch is. Um, it's a great question. I don't know. I'll have to look. <laughs> I'm gonna have to look it up. Um, but it might maybe the in in flight abort. I don't know. Um, let's see. Thanks. This is exciting stuff. This is for Texas. Had to switch back to Periscope because of YouTube annoys me. <laughs> Sorry, Surefire. Um, uh, we're about to do some giveaways, so you might want to switch back over to YouTube because we're gonna do a couple of giveaways. Um, let's see where are my where are my stickers? Um, and I don't have uh yeah okay so let's see tori is harboring the area 51 aliens so they don't get found during the storming event <laughs> anybody going to storm area 51 september 20th send me some video i want to know how it is uh i don't recommend it though <laughs> don't i if you're asking me don't do it um but if you do, send me some video. Um, let's see. What is the next launch you'll be giving live commentary for? Well, probably the next launch that I'll be live for is going to be our own launch, Overlook Horizon 20, where we'll be testing our live video system again on our weather balloon flight. Um, so make sure you subscribe and, uh, you know, like and follow and do all that kind of stuff. Um, for that because that'll probably be the next live thing that we have but uh i don't know what the next live i don't know i plan these things about like three or four days ahead of time <laughs> um so i'll have to look at it i'm not really sure um crs 19 is net october 15th uh, says gregorius so hello gregorius i wasn't expecting gregorius to be here today but uh oh salcom 1b is net september there you go so that's probably the next one is going to be salcom Outcome 1B. Um, I don't see, why does that not show up on my schedule here? Well, I don't know. All right, well, uh, I was trying to get you an answer there, um, but yeah, that doesn't come up, it does not come up on my schedule anywhere. The next thing that comes up on my schedule is a Dragon in-flight abort, which just says to be determined, because <laughs> we don't have a day for that yet. Um, Let's see. All right, so let, oh wait, John is back. Let's switch back over to John. Uh, he's saying something. 
don't have the volume up. All right, so basically, basically what he said is that the uh, the burn is coming up for um, uh, yeah this relight. And recognition. We've got good ignition. Chamber a pressure one is burn. on target. So this is a one-minute burn. This burn a is going than... to last about one minute. Yep. As you can see from the velocity counter, we're That's going to add lot. about 2.6 kilometers per second. There. That's how much velocity we need to put into the orbit to get from the low Earth parking orbit we started from into the final geostationary transfer orbit required by the Spacecom customer. We're beginning to throttle down the second stage engine to keep G-loads on the spacecraft underneath the required levels. Getting ready for shutdown of the second stage engine. Look how, how fast that velocity goes up. That is crazy. And this is a long burn for a second stage relight. A lot of times they're, they can be like three or four seconds. Head back shutdown. We've got a good shutdown. Waiting for the orbit call out now. We want a good orbit insertion or nominal orbit insertion. We'll evaluate. Nominal evaluate. orbit insertion. There it is. And the guidance officer over the countdown net has called out a nominal orbit insertion. Looking into plots, it's a really good looking orbit for the Falcon 9, still carrying the Amos 17 spacecraft on top. So now that we're in a good orbit, we're going to be coasting for the next four and a half minutes or so. So we're going to stop live commentary, but we'll be back at T plus 31 minutes, 30 seconds for the final event, the deployment of the Amos 17 satellite. All right, so they, uh, and then they bring the music back up, so I got to turn it back down. Uh, but I'll try not to miss it this time. I was a little bit late getting to it. Um, but uh, what were we talking about beforehand? We do got to get to the Rocket Lab announcement. We're, I guess we're going to wait at this point now. We're going to wait until after deployment here. But uh, I want to give away a couple of stickers here real quick. Um, we're going to give away uh, an Overlook Horizon sticker and a Space Lobster sticker today. Um, and we'll send those out. Let me get the Space Lobster stickers here. Sweet. Actually, you know what? We'll, we'll give away two Space Lobster stickers today because it's a Space Lobster anniversary um, of our flight. So... Uh, we're going to try to do this really, really quick. Um, so I'll throw this up here while I pull up Nightbot. Um, we'll see um, we'll see if we can do this quickly, at least get one or two. So if you want to join the giveaways, what you got to do, there's a couple of rules and things like that. You got to be in an eligibility area. We might not be able to give these away in, in time. We got like two minutes. All right, let me just throw out the rules and I'll tell you that and then we'll do it after deployment. Um, but so you got to be in the eligibility area, which is the US, Canada, the European Union, or the UK. There's a couple exclusion zones that you can't be in, but for the most part, it's those four areas. Um, and then in order to enter, you got to go to youtube.com slash OLHCN, find this video, and just throw in a comment when I tell you. And we're not tracking those yet. Um, but uh, you'll have to be on the YouTube channel in order to be entered uh, because Nightbot, which is what uh, the service that is going to pick the winner for me. Um, they are going to pick it randomly, um, but uh, it only supports uh, YouTube. So uh, it does not, unfortunately, does not support Periscope or Twitch or, or actually it does support Twitch. Um, so I think technically you could be on Twitch as well, um, but it doesn't support Facebook. Um, but uh, yeah, I will put that up. Uh, and get that ready to go. And then we'll do the giveaways after because we're like 30 seconds away from them coming back um, and doing deployments. So so here's the rest of the plan here for today. Um, we'll watch deployment. We will talk about Rocket Lab and their big announcement. And then uh, or we'll watch the deployment. We'll do giveaways. We'll uh, talk about Rocket Lab. And we'll call it a night, I think. Yeah, does that, that sound like enough? That's enough, I think. I think they're coming back here. Yep. Is ...that SpaceX manufactures installs on the back end of the second stage, looking at the MVAC-D nozzle from both sides. Now currently we are halfway across Africa between Gabon and the Heart of Beastock ground stations. 
That's where we're getting ready to get telemetry of payload deploy. That should be coming up in about 40 seconds from now. Now currently the second stage flight computer will send a command to the separation band that clamps Amos 17 to the Falcon 9. The band opens and small springs between the spacecraft and the second stage will open, gently pushing the satellite away from the second stage. So this should be coming up. Good view of the Amos 17 here. satellite from the camera we'll atop the second at 31 stage. Scheduled 3155. Waiting for Five payload seconds. separation event. All right, right there is the scheduled time. That can fluctuate by a couple of seconds. Um, really, they, pu they, they publish a time, and then there it goes. Yeah. AVI confirm spacecraft separation. A little bit of debris floating around there. Mostly likely ice. Uh, always great to see like the spacecraft floating away from the Falcon 9 second stage. So we've got a good deployment on time. We're in the desired orbit. And with that, we're going to bring our webcast to a close. Looks but it's been well. a great webcast for the I Falcon know. 9 team. We had a liftoff delayed 30 minutes by bad weather at the Cape. But just before we went on the air, the last of the weather rules went from red to green. The range was ready to support. We counted down and launched at 23 minutes after the hour. First stage did its job before separating. There is no recovery plan for the first stage today. It will re-enter and break up in the atmosphere. Second stage continued on with two great burns, first into parking orbit and then into the final orbit. Expected losses. Just now on. we saw the separation of the Amos 17 spacecraft in the desired geostationary transfer orbit. So again, a great day for Falcon 9 and the Amos 17 customer. Thank you to our customers, Spacecom, and also to the 45th Space Wing for range safety and the FAA for licensing today's launch. We'd also like to thank all of our view viewers for tuning in. Follow our website and social media platforms for updates on the catch for the fairing halves as well as our next missions and milestones. Until next time, have a great night. All right, so there it is. Another successful flight for SpaceX successful launch and deployments. Um, I was I was thinking back I was, when I was watching that deployments. I don't know why, but um, like just watching. Uh, here we're gonna switch this back here for uh, a quick second here. If I can re, can I replay it? Yeah, replay. Go back to here. Oh well, let me replay because I already ended. Mm. Okay, well I can't replay it. Um, well what I was gonna try to show you was uh, the. The re as the satellite was drifting off, it just looked very like. Here we are. No, so I just had to re refresh the page. And so I'm staring at this this view here, and it just I don't know. It looks so like. I, don't know, I want to use the word lonely, but that's not that's not the word I'm looking for. I don't know what word I'm looking for, but like just this satellite drifting off into the pitch black darkness. It almost looks like it's going to the bottom of the ocean. But it's just, it's very eerie looking and it's just kind of floating away and there's just, like, you can't see the earth in this picture. It's just dark and black and there's nothing to see there. It's just, it's very, it was a very eerie thing to see. I don't know, I was just watching that and that's what I, that's what I noted while I was watching. <laughs> So, all right, before uh, too many people head out, uh, we're going to do a couple of giveaways. We've got three giveaways to do, three stickers. Um, we did, if you were if you won the last giveaway, they did kind of go out a little bit late. They did go out uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, and they were a little bit later because we had a couple of our flights in there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we got a couple of giveaways. We'll do a couple of stickers. If you don't win the stickers, you can always buy one in the Overlook Horizon shop, overlookhorizon.com slash shop. Um, you can always get, get one there. Or... Big news, we didn't even really announce this. There we go, sorry, I had to reach across the desk. We didn't even really announce this, um, but if you noticed on our flights, my flight suit has our official mission patch on it. We have official mission mi mission, mission patches now. Um, and you can buy these in the o Overlook Horizon shop as well. Uh, at some point, I'm gonna give one away. I'm not gonna give one away today, um, only because we we only have a few left. We, actually, we put them in the shop kind of quietly. I did put something out on Twitter. Um, but uh, we uh, um, we did put these in the shop, and 
Uh, they almost sold out. We only have a couple left. Um, so we got more coming. We only ordered just a few to start with. Um, just that we wanted to make sure that they that they look nice. And I think they actually came out really good. Can you see this? Uh, if I go that way, it gets out of my, my studio lights here. Let's see, which way? This way. There you go. They actually look pretty nice. The sewn mission patch there. I got to keep it like here so it, you can actually see it in the lights. Um, but yeah, it's our little logo there and it's a, a sewn patch. Um, it's the real deal right there. Mission patch. You can buy one of those in the Overlook Horizon store. No giveaway for that today. Um, but uh, when we get some more in and I get the, the bigger batch, then we'll probably do a couple giveaways. So, Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, did you send my, did you send my witch I won four weeks ago? Um, well, I did say if you won something on, what was it? The STP2 launch, I think is the last time we did giveaways. I just sent those out. Maybe what day are we on? I sent those like Friday. Um, so they just went out. Um, so, uh. So a lot of people like the mission patches. Everybody's like, yeah, there's only a couple left. If you want to get one, there's just a couple left in the store. Um, and then it's going to be a couple weeks. We're still waiting a couple weeks before the rest of them come in. Um, so if you want to get one of the uh, the mission patches, there's only a couple left. Um, there you go. Oh, hey, thanks, Mark. Mark threw over a little tip on the Super Chats. 100% uh, of that goes to Overlook Horizon Inc., which is a 501c3 nonprofit educational charity organization that's that's us um so thanks mark i appreciate that i really appreciate uh the tip there um okay so to uh to enter the giveaways i threw this up already but you and we talked about it earlier you got to go to the youtube channel throw in a comment just say hello i've been tracking the comments here for the last couple minutes i'll give you maybe like 30 more seconds to get into it which means i got to do like a minute uh, because by the time you hear me say i'm giving you 30 seconds it's already been 30 seconds, and then I got to do 30 more. Complicated. So the joys of streaming delays. Um, but uh, yeah, so how do I get to the store? Overlookhorizon.com slash slash. I need some water. I didn't have a drink with me today. My mouth is getting dry. Overlookhorizon.com slash shop. If you want to get to the store and you can get yourself a sticker or a patch if you don't win today. Uh, sticker me, says Catherine. Um, let's see, pick me. Yeah. Don't send, uh, somebody sent over a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of emojis and, uh, symbols and stuff. Don't do that. Nightbot doesn't like that. I think it's got a cap of like eight emojis that you can send over at one time. If you go more than eight, it freaks out and it's like, no, nah, no, don't. That's too many. Um, so we got a whole bunch of people in here commenting, which is fantastic. Um, Let's see, I'm getting, I'm gonna make sure my Nightbot is actually tracking all these. Yes, it is. So awesome, we got a whole bunch of people that are eligible to win a sticker. So um, because it's the, we'll do the Nightbot, or not Nightbot, <laughs> Jeez, getting tired. We'll do the Space Lobster one first because it is the Space Lobster anniversary. Overlook Horizon 15 was one year ago today. Space Lobster flew to 100,490 feet on Overlook Horizon 15 and then was auctioned off. So sadly, I don't have the actual lobster anymore. He was auctioned off last year, went on to greener pastures, uh, but uh, we still have the sticker. We got the sticker left, uh, the mission patch sticker. And I think I, I maybe I, this was kind of a test run for the mission patches, but I feel like we ought to make like a real mission patch of the, the Space Lobster. Don't you think? Is anybody on board with that? I think we should. Um, so we might have patches of those. I haven't ordered those yet, but I think I want to. Um, all right. Wow. A whole bunch of people that are eligible here. So, okay. So we're going to do the first giveaway, but keep your comments here flowing. And uh, and then uh, once we... Uh, I'll throw this up one more time. We'll let Nightbot pick a winner uh, from the commenters. And then... Uh, and then we'll do some more. So keep the comments rolling here. Um and we'll do it okay here we go three two one roll it first sticker up is going to solaris solaris uh, has won the space lobster sticker um so in order for you to get the space lobster sticker you got to send me a direct message on facebook or twitter or go to overlookhorizon.com contact us and send me your address where you want it sent to as long as you're in the you're in the u.s canada european union or the uk it's yours 
Um, so send me that direct message and just tell me where you want it sent. Give me your address. I don't do anything with your address. I literally just write it on an envelope and then I get rid of it. Um, so yeah, send that over to me and uh, it will be yours. Okay. And uh, that, so now we're going to do the uh, the secondary Space Lobster sticker. This was kind of like our alternative mission patch. This is this is like an animated lobster here. It's like a drawn lobster. This is like a picture of the actual lobster that flew on board. So that's that was a picture, thanks to Alex Ziggyful on our YouTube channel, that designed both of these, uh, both of these patches. So thanks to Alex Ziggyful. Um, but uh, I took a picture of this and sent it over to Alex Ziggyful, and he uh, uh, photoshopped the... Uh, uh, hacking darn out of this and, <laughs> and turned it into a patch some, or a sticker somehow. I don't know. That's Photoshop magic for me. Um, but anyways, all right, we'll give this away to somebody else here. Uh, how do I... Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, go. Roll it. There you go. John Wilson. John, that's heading over to you. That's the Space Lobster secondary mission patch logo. Uh, again, just send me a direct message on, uh, usually Twitter is the best. That's probably the easiest. Um, so, but either uh, Twitter or Facebook or e even Instagram or overlookhorizon.com slash contact. And you can send us a message there as well. Just need your address and it's, uh, and it's yours. All right. Somebody said, uh, was it Mark said, you should let Joe Bernard drop a landing rocket from your balloon. I, I would love to do that, except... The FAA regulations will not allow that. Um, so the FAA, you can drop stuff from a balloon. It gets a little bit, a little, uh, you kind of jump into a different class of, uh, of uh, safety there if you're dropping things from balloon, but uh, from balloons, but it can be done. Remember, these balloons are at 100,000 feet, so they, they go really fast if there's no parachute on board. Uh, they hit whatever their terminal velocity is. Um, but so dropping things is not a huge issue, but the big, big issue is the rocket itself. As soon as you bring up the word rocket to the FAA, they're like, whoa, uh-uh, mm-mm, nope, can't do it on a balloon. Um, so, you, well, it's not that you can't do it. You can do it. It's just you jump in. It's We're in like, you know, the low tier stuff where they're like, oh, you're flying a balloon? All right, whatever, do, do your thing. Um, and it's not really a big deal. Um, you can jump up and get a little bit, you can do heavier weight balloon flights and they're like, okay, we're kind of concerned now. This is a little bit big. We need to work together on this. You can get even bigger than that. And they're like, all right, we really got to sort this thing out. Um, but then when you jump into like, when you start at, even if it's like a model Estes rocket, like a little tiny one that goes like 300 feet in the air, you can't even put that on a weather balloon because as soon as you mention the word rocket going to be on board for a payload there, it's like the sirens go off and the lights go off. They're like, nah, mm, nope, uh-uh, not happening, not on that. Unless you're, you know, you got to go out like over the ocean and do it. Or you can go over to like the Nevada um, test ranges and do it out in the desert. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's kind of crazy. The uh, As soon as you get into rockets, then then they really start paying attention to you, which is not a good thing. It's not really what your goal is with the FAA. <laughs> so um, let's see. So... Um, Okay, I think we got all that. So yeah, John, all right, awesome. John uh, responded there, said, splendid. Yeah, so send me that direct message, John. All right, and the last, uh, we'll do the last one here. This is just our regular Overlook Horizon sticker. Uh, we'll give one of these away. This will be the last one here, and we'll give it away here uh, via Nightbot. Um, so choose one more here, Nightbot. Uh, ready? Uh, three, two, one, roll it. All right, that one's going to Aiden. Aiden, you got yourself an Overlook Horizon sticker. Um, so again, send me a direct message. Um, Facebook, Twitter is probably the best. Uh, you can send it on overlookhorizon.com or even on our Instagram channel. Um, but uh, but there you go. You can uh, send me uh, send me the address where you want those to go. And I will get those out. I'm going to try to get them out a little bit faster than the last ones. We were a little bit slow getting the last ones out. Um, but uh, we're going to try to get these out. A little bit faster. I say that every time, but uh, they always, I set them here on my desk as uh, those need to go out. And then they they stay right there for a long time. So we're going to try to send those out. I'm going to try to do that. If you send me the direct message now, when I end the stream, we will, I'll write the envelopes and send them out right away. 
Um, so there you go. Sneezy Cobra says, ah, he didn't win again. Sorry, Sneezy Cobra um, and Debbie. Uh, you can't win them all. I try. We try to mix it up here. Uh, and actually, I don't even try. I just let Nightbot choose. Nightbot, it's up to Nightbot. You got to we got to whisper sweet nothings to Nightbot. But hey, consolation. If you want to buy one of the stickers or one of the mission patches, overlookhorizon.com slash shop, you can buy one. Uh, wall supplies last, at least for, we got tons of stickers, but the patches, not many until we get the, until we get our uh, commercial resupply mission that uh, delivers our next order of patch, uh, patches to us. Um, so, so Hollerus says, can you give me the email address? Um, I'm not going to publicly put my email address here on the YouTube channel, but uh, if you go to overlookhorizon.com slash contact, or just go to overlookhorizon.com and use the contact us form, um, that'll send an email to me. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the way I, I don't want to publicly throw my email address out there. Um, but you can do it uh, direct message on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or overlookhorizon.com slash contact us. Best ways to get a hold of me and get me a message. Um, so as long as you're in the US, the UK, European Union, or what, uh, Europe, US, Can oh, Canada. How did I forget Canada? US, Canada, UK, European Union, and you're not in one of those exclusion zones. There's a couple of exclusion zones. You check the YouTube description link uh, for the official rules. They're apparent, I say this every time, people are probably sick of it, but there are laws to give away free stuff. Who knew that there's laws to give away free stuff? It's kind of crazy. Um, but there are places that we are legally not allowed to give you free stuff. That's insane to me, but, uh, truth. It's a fact. Okay. Anyways. So, um, just checking out some of the comments that I missed. Uh, so much telemetry you could get from that altitude. Yeah, I know it would be really cool to launch, um, to launch one of those rockets, one of Joe Bar Joe Barnard's rockets on board our uh, on board our balloon. I would love to do something like that. It would be kind of cool. Um, let's see. Are you out of Parker patches? I am not out of Parker Solar Pro patches. Um, I just don't happen to have them here, <laughs> so, or I don't. They're not physically within my reach at the moment. So next time we'll give away some Parker Solar Pro patch. I don't know. We'll, we'll try to mix up the uh, the giveaways. A little bit but we do still have some of those we got lots of stuff to give away um but i just try to mix it up a little bit um okay so let's switch gears here so we uh we thought we had spacex the, the one thing i do want to talk about is we want to get into rocket lab a little bit at least cover it a little bit probably should talk about this a little more in depth maybe in a separate uh a separate video or something but um but I do, I, before we go, I, I do want to chat a little bit about Rocket Lab, because just before we went la live, so we had the SpaceX launch tonight. Um, they uh, Are you going to do a replay? Oh, yeah, we could do a replay um, before we get into Rocket Lab. All right, let's do a replay. Here, I'll make a deal for you. Because um, my throat is like crazy dry right now. I'm going to go grab a glass of water, and I'm going to replay this. Um, so you can watch the launch. Where is my replay here? We'll give you a launch replay, a couple of seconds, um, just until a little ways after separation. And then, uh, really it's probably however much time it takes me to, uh, to go get a glass of water because I'm, my mouth is so dry from talking. Usually I have a glass of water here with me, but I don't, I don't. <laughs> And I still want to talk about Rocket Lab. Stay with me. We're going to talk about Rocket Lab. Um, right, right, Mark is saying rockets plus helicopters. Yes, good preview, Mark. We're talking about Rocket Lab. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But because you guys want to see a replay, which I'm okay with. I like replays. Uh, we are going to... Um, we're going to watch a replay. Replay of the launch. couple of minutes. Let me go get a drink real quick, and then uh, and then when we come back on the other side of the replay here, we're going to talk about Rocket Lab and uh, their big announcement that they had: rockets plus helicopters coming up uh, after the replay here. So let me queue up the replay and get her going, and then I'll probably go uh, off screen for a minute, and uh, and I'll come back and uh, we're going to talk about Rocket Lab. 
see, make sure all my volume is up before I just leave you guys. T minus 30 seconds. Stage one, pressing for flight. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition, lift off. Vehicle is pitching downrange. Guy power and country number. Vehicle is supersonic. Coming up on one minute into flight, we're getting ready for maximum dynamic pressure. Vehicle has reached maximum aerodynamic pressure. You've heard the call out. We're through the region of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Vehicle going supersonic as we leave the denser parts of the lower Earth's atmosphere. Falcon 9 trajectory looks good. All nine Merlin engines are at power. Everything looking good for Falcon 9. We're heading due east from Cape Canaveral, headed to the first of two orbits planned for today. Nice view from the onboard camera, looking back at the plume slowly expanding as we leave the atmosphere, the plume will get larger as we get out to the vacuum of space. Now today, first aid shutdown is planned for about T plus two minutes, 45 seconds. We won't be recovering the first stage today, so that leaves more and propellant to burn to achieve the required orbit for the satellite. If you compare that to last week's CRS-18 resupply flight to the space station, on that mission, the first stage shut down almost half a minute sooner than today. We needed to reserve enough propellant to be able to turn the first stage and return it all the way back to the launch site. Now coming up quickly in 20 seconds, a sequence of events, main engine cut off, the nine main engine shut down, stage separation, and then ignition of the second stage engine coming up in just under 15 seconds. ABI stage separation confirmed. We've had successful ignition of the second stage engine. The Merlin Vacuum D engine is up at power. Turbine speed Page looks one, good. You can see the nozzle beginning to glow red, a tradition stage for two, the upper nominal stage. Trajectory. First stage has completed its mission. It's falling back to Earth. As we said, we won't recover it. Coming up next, fairing separation out in the vacuum of space. You guys, fairing separation confirmed. The position of signal being needed. Nice view in the late afternoon. Sun shining on the payload fairing. The second stage has separated the payload fairing around the Amos 17 spacecraft as we're now in the vacuum of space. Right now, Merlin vacuum engine continues to be on power. Trajectory looks good. Stage two is right in the middle of the predicted path. Avionics reports their systems are nominal. So coming up four minutes and 15 seconds, Mark, we are go on Falcon 9 carrying Amos 17 to the parking orbit, the first of two orbits for today.
Okay, so there we go. How'd you like that little transition there? Uh, yeah, so uh, there we go. There's a little replay of the Amos 17 launch there. Uh, we didn't go all the way to uh, second stage cutoff. Uh, you can always replay and watch the beginning of the stream as well, but I did want to throw... Um, throw a, a little replay in there so that uh, at least if you miss the launch then you have the opportunity to to see it again here real quick um so all right so now what we want to talk about we kind of switch gears a little bit here um so uh i want to talk about rocket lab um we didn't really get into the i gotta mute the spacex stream is still playing in my ear um so i want to get into uh rocket labs announcement because we had another big announcement here today um from rocket lab and i got it queued up here somewhere where is this uh where is it uh there it is okay so let's see let me move this over here to this screen and we'll full screen it here and so the big news of the day uh probably not going to play the music but i highly recommend you watch the Rocket Lab stream because they did some really great production work on some of their videos with some awesome music and um, uh, it's pretty awesome sound to watch some of those videos here. Uh, I watched it right before right before I went live uh, while I was getting the stream ready and such. Uh, but let's see, let me get uh, just getting this queued up here so that we can see it. And then we can watch together and talk about it. So one thing that was that's kind of interesting is um, uh, Peter Beck, has, who's the head of Rocket Lab, has always kind of been, uh, I don't want to say against uh, reusability, but uh, he's been against reusability. <laughs> no, he's... Sorry, it was muted. <laughs> okay. Oh, I always have to remember. This is the problem with having a one-man production team is I have, I'm looking at, trying to look at the camera and talk to you guys here, and my audio is up here. So I, I have to remember to look up at the audio and see if I'm actually talking. <laughs> Otherwise, I just talk and talk and talk and talk. And apparently, you guys don't hear any of that. And I don't remember what I said. Um, so... Okay, let's, uh, yeah, mute everybody. I got nine million message, nine million messages saying that I'm muted. I got it. I know, I know, I know. I was muted. I, I got it. I'm sorry. I figured it out. <laughs> I, I know how to work software good. <laughs> Something like that. Okay, so what were we saying? Start from the beginning, says Gordon. Back it up. Start it over again. Okay, so what I was saying was uh, Peter Beck, who is the head of Rocket Lab has always kind of been against reusability. He's not really, he's just said it really doesn't make sense for Rocket Lab to get into reusability for their rockets because uh, they really weren't that expensive to begin with, but he's kind of changed his mind and they're moving on to reusability and they're going to push forward with reusability for Rocket Lab. Now, their reusability plan is not really reusability in the conventional sense. Uh, and I say, I say conventional like we have a con some sort of convention. It's really just SpaceX and Blue Origin that are landing their rockets. They're landing the first stage um, to, uh, to recover them. So uh, ULA has plans to recover their first stage with a helicopter, and that is what Rocket Lab is going to do. Now, if you don't know what Rocket Lab is, Rocket Lab is a, a smaller space provider, but they are growing very, very fast, and they're, they're, ve they're a very hip 
sort of provider. They're very, they're very interesting. They have a really cool rocket, some really cool innovative technologies. Um, they have electric turbines on them um, or turbines, whatever you want to call it. I say turbine. Um, but, uh, you know, they have these battery packs that they eject off of the flights and all kinds, you know, a lot of, um, they've got these, this carbon fiber body to it. So a lot of different things that are not on kind of your typical traditional rockets at this point. But they, Rocket Lab has a launch pad in New Zealand. That's their LC1, Launch Complex 1. It's in New Zealand. They launch small satellites, really tiny. I think the size of the Rocket Lab rocket is like, only as tall as the landing legs on the Falcon 9. So the Falcon 9 is huge compared to the Rocket Lab Electron rocket. The Rocket Lab's rocket is called Electron. Um, but they are, you know, it's it's a tiny, tiny rocket compared to the Falcon 9. Um, so it is, um, it, it, that's good for them because it keeps the cost low and they cater to just the, really they cater to the tiny micro satellites, small satellites, those itty bitty provide, you know, they're, that's basically their entire business model, but they've launched out of New Zealand. They're building a launch complex in on Wallops Island in Virginia. That is going to be operational before the end of this year. They're intending to have that operational. So they will have uh, operations from Wallops. Now uh, they are rocket lab is a U.S. company even though they are flying primarily out of New Zealand right now. They have another flight coming up in nine days. Uh, it's called Look Ma, No Hands. It's kind of the other nice thing about Rocket Lab is they, they name their flights with these crazy names and everybody loves them, uh, including me. Um, so I, I love all the names of their flight. They had, uh, let's see if we can remember them. They had like Just a Test, Still Testing, um, It's Business Time. They had... Um, I don't know, something about a cactus. I can't remember what that one was called. And then this one is called Look Ma, No Hands. Um, so, yeah. Um, but, uh, oh, yeah. So, Gregorius brings up kind of a point for the reusability, too, that I didn't mention. So, they um, they had previously said that they weren't going to do reusabil reusability because um, bringing the, trying to do reusability is really hard, believe it or not. Um so to bring, let's let me. I'm gonna full screen myself here while we while we talk about this. So to do reusability, like there are so many things that you have to plan for to bring this rocket back. Like the first stage booster not only has to be able to land itself, but it has to survive all the aerodynamic forces on the way up and the way back down. Um, it has to survive the re-entry heating, which is usually backwards because they're coming in engine bell first. And traditionally, the engine bells never had any sort of thermal protection on them in sort of, you know, your traditional rockets because they didn't need them other than, you know, the, the heat protection of the actual engine bell itself. You know, the outside and the plumbing and the electrical and the structures were all kind of just there. Um, so they never really needed that sort of protection or heat shielding. Um, and so now they're now you got to return it engine bell first, endure all that heating on the outside of the engine bells and all the piping and wiring and things like that. Um, then you have we talked about the load limits that you have from those upper level winds. You're going to experience those on the way back as well. Um, so you're going to basically go through max Q again on the way back down. Um, and so in order to do that. A lot of time, they were they had previously said that in order to do that, they'd have to build their rocket bigger just to fly all the stuff needed to return the booster. Um, but now they're not going to do that. Now they think they have it figured out, um, and so they're going to try. Yeah, they're they're going to try to engineer a way to do re-entry without a re-entry burn, which is crazy. Um, so. SpaceX does a re-entry burn before they usually either do two or three burns before they bring their booster back to the into the Earth's atmosphere. So they, depending on whether they're going back to the launch site or out to sea, they separate. They might do a boost back burn. Usually that's when they go back to the landing site. They'll do a boost back burn to basically push the rocket back the opposite direction. If they're landing out at sea. Um, they usually don't do that boost back burn, but they will do a re-entry burn, and that's to slow the first stage booster down 
before it starts hitting the atmosphere so that it's not screaming into the atmosphere and just generating crazy amounts of heat. Um, so Peter Beck said during the during the announcement today that that they were basically going to be experiencing half the temperature of the sun on at the bottom of their rocket where the engine bells are during re-entry, which is insane. Um, so they're doing this without a re-entry burn because they have no fuel left. Um, and they want to, they're going to bring this first stage booster down. They're going to throw out a balut, which I loved. I was super happy to see a balut in there or a balut, depending on how you pronounce it, either a balut or a balut, which if you don't know what that is, I'm going to show you what that is because I love them. Um, and then, uh, then they'll have a traditional parachute and then they're going to bring in a helicopter and swoop in and grab this thing with a helicopter and bring it back. So they're not going to be landing it like SpaceX lands it on a barge or like Blue Origin lands theirs on a launch pad or a landing pad or Blue Origin is also planning to land it on a barge as well um, for their new Glenn rocket. But they're going to parachute it in and swoop in and grab the parachute with a helicopter. And surprisingly, Peter Beck said during the announcement today that the hard part, you would think that the hard part would be catching it with a parachute or catching the parachute with a helicopter. But that, he was like, that's nothing. That's the easy part. The hard part is getting this thing back through the atmosphere so that you can even do, you know, even attempt that part. So that's going to be insane. I don't know how they're going to, I don't know how they're going to do that, but that's, that's interesting. And I love this kind of new space stuff. Uh, this is what gets me excited about space flight. And I think this is what's going to get the general public excited about space flight is seeing, seeing uh, SpaceX do that kind of stuff, Blue Origin do that stuff, even Rocket Lab get into that kind of stuff. And hopefully United Launch Alliance will kind of get into that stuff as well. Um, United Launch Alliance has always been kind of the workhorse of, um, of our, um, satellite launching capabilities here in the US, uh, but not necessarily the most uh, energetic or entertaining to watch for people. So at any time I've tried to stream the ULA launches, like sometimes they can be a little bit dry. Um, it's not really a knock against ULA, but they're, it's just not their focus. Their focus has always been, we're gonna do, we're gonna launch the mis mission, we're gonna be a satellite launch provider. We're gonna do it and do it really well. And they get crazy good accuracy when they launch their satellites and even like things like the Mars InSight lander. You know, ULA can hit these pinpoint orbital um, uh, injection points and hit these timelines like down to the 10th of a second, which is absolutely insane. But um, so it's not really a knock against ULA, but I think some of this new space stuff from Rocket Lab and Blue Origin and SpaceX is kind of reinvigorating the space flight industry and, and the general public to get people interested in doing this, uh, this sort of thing again. So, um, so uh, let's see, Wayno says the hard part is finding a crazy helicopter pilot. Actually, so, I mean, based on what Peter Beck said during the announcement is it's actually not it's he actually he was like you know I, I actually fly helicopters and this is not that crazy of a concept um so that's that's gonna be really interesting to see how they do it so we're gonna play the video here so you can actually see what's going on um but uh let's see um, from the pictures he was showing on the stream they're trying to do a supersonic shockwave engineering um not to mention the thing he called a plasma knife yet yeah, some of this stuff is um, like way over my head. So like I'm a software engineer. So, and I understand some of the technical concepts that they're talking about, but I'm not an aerospace engineer by any means or a rocket scientist. So some of this stuff, I was just like, what? <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, but all right, so let's take a look at, so I'm going to play the video. I'm not going to play any of the, uh, sound that goes along with it, but, uh, well, at least play the video so you can see what's happening here. And uh, so basically, here, they're gonna launch the, the uh, Electron rocket, which, I'll oh, pause for a second. If you've never watched a Rocket Lab launch, I would definitely recommend it, because they are pretty entertaining um, to watch. And the Electron rocket, when it ignites, it's like, I mean, it, it's just a big bang. It's kind of it's crazy to watch, and I love it every single time. I crank the volume way up, and they get down to, 
you know, they they all got that Australian accent. Sorry, Aussies, I'm going to do an Australian accent the best I can do, but they get that like tin, nay, whatever. It's a terrible Australian accent. Never do that again. Um, but anyways, it's just interesting to listen to the Australian accent, the, the down under, and then they get down to three, three, two, one, and you hear just boom, they get this big bang of an ignition, and then it lifts off. It's very entertaining to watch, so my apologies for the Australian accent. That was just horrendous. All right, let's continue watching the video. Uh, so yeah, they're taking off this helicopter from this um, helipad that's going to be out at sea. Uh, on a ship here, they'll go through the normal flights, they'll do separation, and then here's where it gets crazy. So this first stage booster, first of all, I don't understand, I mean, they show it kind of floating backwards, it doesn't really make sense physics-wise to me, but um, I don't understand how they're going to get to be engine bell first in the first place. Somehow they'll have to flip it around because they'll be in a ballistic trajectory, um, but they're going to be coming in engine bell first, no re-entry burn, nothing propulsive whatsoever, they're just coming in and like, look at this gigantic shockwave that's being generated here. Huge, huge amounts of heat at those engine bells. There's the balut. That's the balut or the balut right there. It's basically a balloon slash parachute. Then they get a traditional parachute here that's like a, a parafoil. Uh, that just kind of lets it float there and then they'll just fly this thing in and they're going to grab the line here between uh, the balut and the parachute right there. They just grab it and then go. And then, and then they got it and they just bring, the, they just kind of sky hook this thing in. And then, I don't know, somehow they're going to land it. They didn't show how they're going to land it, but that is insane. That's crazy. This, this part is the crazy part, the, the heating. And then I just like the, I just like the balut, the fact that they're going to use one of those for the balut. Um, so SpaceX talked about using one of these for their second stage re-entry. So this is kind of a similar concept to what SpaceX was going to do for their, their second stage re-entries. You're going to upset everyone now. I'm assuming, is that about my Australian accent? Um, oh, New Zealand. Sorry, New Zealand accent. New Zealand, Australia. They're both they're like right next door to each other, aren't they? <laughs> um So uh, let's see. I hope it comes soon. Sounds acrobatic. Their rockets certainly go up fast. They do go up fast. Is there a launch today? Uh, yeah, you missed the launch. Uh, that's from Ante on uh, Periscope. Yeah, the launch that we actually covered was a while ago. There's the there's the balut or the balut. You let me know in the comments what you said. You say balut or balut? I always call it a balut, uh, but I've I've heard it I've heard it called both ways. Uh, but essentially. Like I, you know, like everybody's super familiar with the loot. Uh, but this, can I get a, can I get a pause right there? Yeah. So that's basically it right there. It's, it's essentially a parachute. It's kind of like a drogue parachute, but it's inflated. Um, and that slows it, you know, that's meant to um, slow it down, but not generate a ton of shock on the, the, the rigging there. Um, so it can come out at a lot higher speeds than a traditional parachute could. Um, Let's see. They must have been engineering the bottom area with re-entry in mind for cable routing. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thing. Is you have to wonder, like, well, how long have they been thinking about this re-entry thing here? Because they've they must have been thinking about it for you know, like Mark said, for cable cable routing and all that kind of stuff. Or they've just completely shifted gears and done that quickly. Um. So in so in theory, this is, um. You know, they could just. Let, you know, they bring this back down, they could just bring it right up on the pad with practically no refurbishing and connect another upper stage and just launch again. And that, you know, that's another thing to bring the, uh, the cost down. Um, let's see. A Kiwis love being called Australian. <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry. Sorry to all the New Zealanders. Um, I was more referring to the accent. I don't know. New Zealand, Australia. It's all the same to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry to all our Australian and New Zealand viewers. Um, let's see. I wonder if they will do specific tests such as drop tests or if this will be conducted as a post-mission event. Yeah, so I, from my understanding from the, the announcement is this is going to be basically like a post-mission event. They're going to launch the regular mission and then their testing is going to happen 
during their missions. Um, so they're going to, um, I mean, they're, they have, um, they had the numbers up here. Um, let's see if I can pull it up here in the, uh, where was it? Yeah, he talked about the aerodynamic loading. He showed some of the, the imagery of what they were going to experience for aerodynamic loading, um, as well as heating as well, which is insane. Like here's that, this was the plasma knife that he was talking about. So it's coming in at a 10 degree angle of attack, which is intentional to try to route some of the, the heating around the vehicle. So this is kind of a, uh, um, a um, what is this called? A, a flow diagram, it's not the word I'm looking for. There's another word for this, but, um, um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's the plasma knife that we mentioned earlier. Um, that's a concept that I can't even begin to understand. Oh, here you go. So here was, did I miss it? There it is. So, so yeah, flight, uh, flight six, they've, they've been measuring stuff. That's done. Flight seven, they measure more. That's done. Flight eight, they're going to be adding advanced instrumentation. Flight 10, they're doing a block upgrade for their, for the actual electronic rocket itself. Um, and then, uh, I like, I like flight N try to bring one home. Um, so yeah, they, uh, there's a lot they have to get through, but this is kind of what they're going to be working towards for the next couple of flights, which is just insane shock force diagram there you go thank you wind t <laughs> I, like, I like gregorius's name for it gregorius says it's called a wind tunnel thingamagic yeah i like that better i like that title for the graph there uh they're gonna um choose a gun hey i don't mind we aussies are used to taking credit for kiwi achievements <laughs> um let's see potato potato says Catherine. yeah um, so yeah, that's kind of the plan, um, for Rocket Lab. It's, so it's, it's a really exciting time for, um, for all these new space industries to get into this sort of reusability. If you think back, like, I don't know what it, it's probably like, was it 10 years ago? But think back 10 years ago, like people were looking at SpaceX saying they were going to reuse their, their first stage boosters and people were like, yeah, okay, sure you are. Good luck. You know, they saw Elon Musk, you know, this crazy billionaire that, you know, had these crazy ideas and he's just going to waste money and throw stuff away. And then all of a sudden he started landing these boosters and like, oh, hey, wait a minute here. That's kind of a good idea. And then, uh, you know, now the ESA is trying, they're looking into reusability for like their, their uh, area in space. Um, they're trying to develop reusability as well. United Launch Alliance is trying to develop reusability. So... A lot, uh, a lot of people are getting on the bandwagon here. Um, let's see. Oh, hey, I got a tweet from Elon. I just saw it. Uh, Sebi Time Waster just threw it up in our Discord channel. Let's see. Rocket fairings fall from space and caught by miss by the Go Miss Tree boat. Look at this. All right, we got to show you this because this is fantastic. All right, here, let's pull it up here. All right, good segue because I'm pretty much talking about done talking about Rocket Lab, but uh, let's get this up here. And can I put this over on this screen? Yeah, look at this. This is today. This is during the SpaceX Amos 17. Look at this. You can see, why is it so choppy? I don't know if that's my computer or the actual feed. Look at that boat. It's just like chilling under there. That's go Miss tree with a gigantic net. And it just gently touches in there. How insane is that? That's crazy. So Elon just tweeted this out a few minutes ago. This is, uh, this is tonight's recovery. I guess it is. It does look like the boat is, is moving forwards. It just kind of looks like it's gently floating there from whatever angle this is. I don't know, whatever camera this is. I don't know if this is a drone cam or if this is a, um, this has got to be like some sort of drone cam to catch this footage, right? Um, some sort of UAV, I think. Look at that. How awesome is that? That is fantastic. That is so cool. Um, and I'm glad we actually got footage. So it must be the SpaceX stream. You guys have to tell me if it's cutting in and out. 
for you guys too, but this must be the SpaceX stream that's jittery like this because it just keeps jittering over and over again. Um, Pat has... That, that seems like... I mean, we didn't really get a view of the last catch. We kind of just saw it from the boat, but that that almost... That seems like a picture-perfect catch right there. Like, that's almost in the center of the net. And, I mean, that boat is... That boat is definitely in position. Look at how gently it's coming down, too. Like, this is not what I pictured at all. When they first said they were going to be doing this, like, I did not picture this coming down this slowly and gently whatsoever. This is not what I envisioned. I, I figured it was going to be coming in hot. Um, but that's pretty cool. That's cool to see. And look at the sky in the background. That sky looks pretty awesome, too, right? That's a pretty... This is a great video. I wish it didn't stutter and jitter so much, but that is that is a great great shot right there. Yeah, it's on a it's on a loop. Somebody's confused. It, it's yeah. This is a, I'm playing the video from Twitter, um, so yeah, it just keeps looping over and over. Uh, but yeah, it's coming down. SJO says it's coming down a lot slower than I would have thought. Yeah, me too. It comes. It's coming down like way slower than I thought it was coming down as well. Um, they, Mark says they changed the parachute system significantly recently. Oh, you have to let me know. I don't know what changes they made to the parachute system. Uh, I assume they must have made some sort of changes um, because now they seem to they seem to have it. And one of the things that Elon also said uh, on Twitter a couple weeks back is that the the boat and the fairing are both autonomously coordinating to get to the same place. Um, so they are. Uh, you know, hopefully they're they've improved, obviously they've improved that at the point where they can they can be there to catch it and this is this is pretty fantastic if they can I mean they're they're getting to the point where they're almost reusing everything on this rocket just the second stage we're losing here um that that's insane um somebody says Jimmy Busby says third stage and second stage in the background. I don't think that's the second stage. I think that's just camera glare. I don't think you're seeing the second stage because this is 45 minutes. Uh, this landing was 45 minutes after launch. So the second stage would be, would be well, well gone. I don't see, I don't see the second stage anywhere in this view here. Um, I think that little white spot you're seeing up in the air, I think that's just camera glare. Cause if you watch, Towards the end of the video, like especially when the camera tilts down, that whole white spot moves down, like right, uh, right when they move the right there. See how the, the whole white spot moves down as well. Um, so I don't think I'm assuming that's what you're seeing. That's just camera glare. Um, oh, Mark says the angle of attack of the fairing is much different than previous attempts. So that's good. To, that's interesting to know. That's one of the big things that they were trying to work out with this this fairing. It's a super awkward thing to come down under parachute because the the fairing itself is not very aerodynamic. It does not want to float flat like that or you know through the air. Um, so that's uh, that that's something that they've had to work out to be able to control it. Um, seems like this parachute catch net is more viable than that. Of, of course, I of course I still love you. I mean, well, of course I still love you is is pretty reliable for recovering the first stage boosters. But yeah, there this is this is the plan for recovering the fairings. Um, and if they can do this, so now they now if they, it's good to see they have got some consistency. So this is this is the second time that they've landed the fairing, half of the fairing. So the other half will soft land in the water. Now the goal would be, can you land one? They're supposed to be able to, uh, with this boat, supposed to be able to land one, drop the net, attach another net, land a second one in rapid succession like that. And that way they could just stagger the, fair, the two fairing halves as they come in, land one, drop the net, another net over, land the second one, catch both of them on the same net. If they can do that, then you got no refurbishment. It's uh, it'd be awesome. Uh, Gordon says it's 3 a.m. He's leaving. Yeah, I don't blame you, Gordon. <laughs> it's only uh, 9 p.m. here. Uh, I think the angle between parafoil and fairing is meant as kind of a speed control, so this time it might have had to catch up with uh, with Gomez Tree. Uh, I mean, I imagine they do mess with the that angle attack a little bit. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if we're seeing that in this video. It seems like kind of a late stage to do a lot of you know too much speed control at this point. Um, 
Let's see, I saw another comment. Where was it? Um, let's see. Could they still find the second stage in the daytime and recover it too? Well, the, no, the second stage, um, this second stage is, uh, I don't even think it's re-entering. Uh, where's my, we didn't even show this during the broadcast, but I do have a hazards map. I was going to show during the broadcast, but yeah, the second, this second stage is not, this one's not even re-entering at all. Um, so that upper stage is going to go into a disposal orbit, and that will that will be out there. It's not coming back to Earth. The first stage is coming back in a million pieces um, because they don't have um, they don't have enough fuel to do a re-entry burn. They don't have grid fins on it to do any sort of con have any control authority while it's coming in. So that is going to smash into the water into a million pieces. Um, there's no uh, no chance of recovery of the first stage at all. Um, oh, there you go. Mark says the idea was to get it to sink at a more vertical rate without as much horizontal speed. That would make sense. Yeah, if you can, a lot of times, if you can scrub off that horizontal speed, especially when, on parachutes, like, you know, one of the hardest things and one of the thing, things that I was thinking about challenging wise is like, you got to remember, you got to control this parachute coming down, but you also have to compensate for any wind that's in the area because the wind is going to want to blow this around. So it's not like the, uh, you know, like at a propulsive landing, you you know, the wind is kind of negligible because you can pretty much direct it wherever you want it to go. But in this sort of like passive control system, like you are at the mercy of the wind. So you get a strong wind gust and you're, you've you got to compensate for that wind that's going to take you down range somewhere. So uh, you almost have to calculate that ahead of time. You know, I wonder if what kind of calculations they're doing prior to this, these fairing recoveries? Like, are they compensating and actually predicting the wind like we do with our weather balloons? Are they going to, are they going to predict that, okay, at this altitude, it's going to push it this far and this altitude is going to push it this direction and this far, and then they kind of position the boat based on those wind predictions? That would be kind of cool. That'd be kind of crazy. Um, let's see, reducing the need for capture vessel to match velocity. Yeah, that, that's a good, a good thought. It does seem like it's going a lot slower. And in some of the earlier tests, seemed like uh, Mr. Steven slash Miss Tree was having to having a high tail it to the payload fairing but um, but yeah they've uh, if they can start catching bolts halves that's a six that's six million dollars of hardware requiring requiring very little refurbishment yeah that's that would be fantastic if they can catch it and keep it out of the salt water that would be uh, that would do a lot to uh, improve the uh, uh, improve that reusability there so all right let's see any more uh, sorry I was looking at some notifications here um, let's see what uh, what else came uh, came out here I got a couple of people that uh, that one already sent me their address so awesome um, so yeah, what else do we want to know? We chatted for a while. It's been a while. Does the net close up so the fairing doesn't fall off in case of bad weather or rough seas? Yeah, so that after it lands on the net, they, they pull the parachute in and then that net will drop and then they secure the they secure the payload fairing to the deck. So there's like a little crow's nest there that they put the payload fairing in and it'll get secured to the deck um, and covered with a, with a tarp as well. Um, so they secure it and cover it and that's when it... Uh, that's how it rides back to Port Canaveral. So, so yeah, it won't stay in the net for the ride back. It will be uh, secured down to the deck there. Um, Gregorius said over in our Discord channel, it seems like having two catcher's mitts would be better than having one to catch two fairings. Yeah, so I think, I don't know, I always wondered if they were going to build a second boat for it, but it, I believe the plan is it's just going to be land in the first net, drop it, throw a second net up, net up and then catch it and uh, I catch the second one. And I believe they're, they're working on being able to do that really, really quickly. Uh, Kumat said, is that driverless automated boat? Uh, I believe there are, it's not driverless. There are people on board, but it is autonomously uh, guided during the payload fairing recovery stage. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't believe there's a, a boat driver in there like looking out the window kind of you know, checking to see if it's coming down in the right place. They're, uh, it's autonomously guided, but there are people on board. Um, unlike 
the drone ship, of course, I still love you. There are no there are no people on board that. That's completely autonomous. There's nobody even on board. Uh, these are this actually has people. A lot less risk to the people here with a payload fairing coming in nice and slowly like this versus a first stage booster fully loaded with rocket fuel. It's a little bit more dangerous. You don't want any people around there in case something goes wrong. Um. All right, let's see. Does the net? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is a fast boat. Yeah, the Mister uh, Mister Steven slash Mystery is a very fast boat, super high speed. It can definitely travel way faster than the drone ship. Um, this whole exercise is as much for data as it is for actually catching val valuable materials. Yeah, I mean it's definitely still an experimental process, but you can see the progress. They're they're getting. I mean, now we've got two consistent fairing catches here. Um, that's pretty awesome. Uh, Aiden says so. They lost one. That no. So the the second half is going to soft land in the water, and then they have another recovery ship called Go Navigator that is going to pick that up out of the water and bring it back. That'll need a little bit of minimal refurbishing from the salt water, um, but uh, but they are still they're basically planning on recovering both of them. Um, so they have both fairing halves recovered and brought back to back to Cape Canaveral. Uh, but one lands in the net, the other one soft lands in the water, and then they'll scoop it up on the water. So they will have both halves. Um, but yeah, hopefully they can someday land two of them in the net, in the nets and not have to pick one up out of the water. Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap this up here. We've been going for uh, a couple of hours. This is the point of the show where I uh, just constantly uh, tell you that I'm leaving. And then uh, whether I do or I don't is uh, another story. But uh, but we're here. We talked about a whole lot. Um, you know, we had a successful launch today for SpaceX Amos 17. We got to see the fairing recovery, which was amazing. Glad to see they've got two fairing recoveries under their belt now. Cat, uh, you know, two catches. Uh, they've recovered before. Picked them up out of the water, but these this is two catches now with the uh, Miss Tree boat. And, uh, and then we talked a little bit about Rocket Lab and their upcoming reusability. So I'm kind of excited to, to get into that. We may have to start streaming some of those Rocket Lab things because I'm, I'm excited to see the reusability. If they live stream those, those parachute pickups, I mean, how awesome would that be? They're, they're talking like Flight 10. That's what they're going to do it. And they're already at, like Flight 8 is coming up, right? So they're, that's like three flights away. Um, that that would be crazy. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to check that out. So, all right. Well, that's gonna do it here for me. Fairings are ten percent in launch vehicle cost, so dry recovery is a pretty big deal. Says Chusicon. Yeah, definitely. All right. Yeah, I think that's gonna do it for me. So, uh, like I said at the beginning of the broadcast, if you're if you're new here, consider subscribing. We talk about space a lot, uh, and we also fly our own high altitude weather balloon missions. And so we've got at least one more of those coming up. Um, hopefully more than one, but uh, we definitely have at least one plan for our high altitude weather balloon launches to do live video. We're, we're not quite as complicated as catching a fairing in a, in a boat yet, but we're working on live video systems from our, our balloon flights, live in-flight video, which is kind of cool. So. Um, so uh, yeah, we're working on improving that ourselves. So join in, subscribe, like the video. Maybe that lets me know that maybe you had a little bit of fun. If you're over on the Periscope channel or uh, you know Twitch or Facebook, you know like or send some hearts or whatever you do. I check all that stuff just to see however you know what everybody thought. Were you interested in this? Did you have some fun with us today? Uh, you know you you let me know what you thought, and uh, you know we'll consider. Uh, it's it's how I decide what to keep doing. What what uh, what is interesting for everybody? So. So there it is. <laughs> Choose a says, place your bets. He's betting on how long I'm going to stay here before I actually leave. Because <laughs> I always say I'm, I'm leaving. And then like 45 minutes later, then I actually leave. So, all right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us here today. Uh, I hope, uh, hope everybody had a little bit of fun. Um, but uh, my name's Tori. This is Overlook Horizon. We'll see you guys all on the next stream and uh, catch you guys later. Everybody have a good night and thanks for joining. All right. Thanks, everybody. See ya.